All right, everyone on the ground, you know what this is? It's not your money. No one be a hero, only your heroes end up dead. Open them top drawers, open the bottom counters, step away. Now I'm jumping over that counter in a second, I'm gonna clear out and then I'm out of here. No one's gonna get hurt. My name is Russell Manser. I am the founder of a company called The Voice of a Survivor. I grew up in a place called uh, Leftbridge Park, which is a suburb of Mount Druitt. Um, uh, it's a low socioeconomic area, just, um, but sold to the earth type people. And for me, growing up there, the only people I've ever seen were getting ahead with the, with the cringe, you know, you know, mainly with the bank robbers and uh, that, that sort of uh, come, and, come and went, you know, you'd see them get out of jail and, and they were sort of people who I looked up to, whether it was bank, bank robbers or drug dealers or, or whatever, they were the sort of people that sort of, I didn't want to be like the working man that was up at the bus stop at six o'clock in the morning. It looked like he was doing nothing with his life. I wanted, I wanted a bit of action and I wanted to live my life comfortably. And uh, those sort of people, you know, sort of look like, from the surface, they look like that's how they were doing it, you know. I know a little bit different now. And what was your family like? I'm the youngest of six kids. Um, uh, my parents were Im uh, uh, Im immigrants from Liverpool, England. I was born in Liverpool, Australia. Um, None of my fam uh, family ever ever got in any sort of trouble. Um, they were just hard working. Most of them, three of my brothers were tradesmen. Uh, my sister was a nurse. Um, my both parents worked in. Uh, they were factory workers uh, in, in the local area. Um, I don't know. It was, uh, it was a, I dare say it was a pretty loving sort of a loving and supportive sort of family. Do you want to talk about the first time you got into trouble and what that experience was like? Yeah. First time I ever got in trouble, it was I was at a place called I was at a suburb called Wilmot, and there used to be these soccer fields there. And over Friday night, Friday and Saturday night, we'd just get there and have bonfires. And um, and um, the cop was pulled up in the old bull wagon and just jumped out, and they just for no reason and, and no reason Ben we were just out late at night, just punched the shit out of a, a whole heap of us. And um, that was my first experience with the police, and it wasn't a good one. You know, I didn't. They never left a, 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 a lasting impression where I just thought, "Geez, I'll never get in trouble." And it made me disrespect them from the way they were treating us. And that wasn't too uncommon for the police to treat us people because they were people that didn't live in the area. They were people from um, the coppers were different people, uh, people from out of the area that just didn't like us because we we're from we we're from Mount Druitt. And um, so, yeah, they, I, I just had a, a pretty horrible sort of uh, an opinion of the police from a young age, you know. Did you want to talk about the first time you got arrested and got sent to Boys Yeah, the first time, um, I remember I was at a mate's house and um, we had a couple of Sarah packs and they called me, they, they're also known as forget me nights, you know, because you don't remember too much what you did on them. And um, we went to Parramatta and, and um, we stole a, a, an old Holden ute and we got in a police chase straight away. We got in a police chase. As soon as we jumped in, back in them days, the coppers used to park cars and then put them under surveillance. And then as soon as someone jumped in and went to steal them, they'd, they'd, put it, they'd have a chase with them. And that's what happened to us that night. We got in a car chase. Um, uh, I, I, acted, I actually got away, but the bloke I was, who was with me, I think he, he, he must have dropped my name because um, the next day the police had been to my mum and dad's house. And they were looking for me. So my mum and dad, being law-abiding citizens, took me down to police station, and um, and then I went before Minda Children's Court, and I was sentenced to uh, six months uh, incarceration. I was sent out to the Derrick Boys Home. Being sentenced for your first time ever, what what do you recall? Like how that felt for you, and, uh, and, what, and what was it like for your parents? Yeah, look, uh, for for me, like I I I I thought you know I was going on some sort of adventure because growing up in the area you hear of all these boys that would been been to the boys' homes and everything like that. And it was like they'd returned from some sort of like some sort of thing in the army, like they'd been to war or something like that. And so I thought I was going on some some adventure and I, I soon found out I wasn't. For my parents, um, you know, it was the first my dad was a pretty hard sort of a guy. He was a merchant seaman and um a big sort of strapping sort of a guy. And it was the first time I'd ever really seen him show, show any sort of emotion. And I'm pretty sure when I was uh, getting sort of led away, I'm pretty sure I seen a bit of a tear in his eye, which sort of really touched me. And um, yeah, and I didn't like what I'd, I'd done to my parents, in particular my dad. When I first got to Derek, Derek was like, Derek was at a place called South Windsor and, and um, there was like four big dormitories there. And when I got there, they had kids dressed up in gym boots and all these different color coded clothing for depending on which house that you were in. 
and I, I first went to the Daru house. And um, when I got in there, there was, you know, first thing people say to you is, where are you from? And I, you know, and I said, Mount Druitt. And, you know, and over in this corner, there was about, uh, in that case, in that house, there was 50 kids and there would have been 15 blokes from, 15 kids from Mount Druitt. So I made my way over to them and, and sort of, and everyone, everyone wants to, it's sort of like, you know, everyone wants to catch up. Have you know this person, you know that person, how they're going? And, and then, um, yeah, it was like, the, the officers there, the screws, they uh, sort of ruled that place with an iron fist and, you know, the, it wasn't hidden what they'd do. They, they'd, they'd build a kid in the head in, in, in front of everyone and, um, you know, it was one of those places where you were seen and not heard, you know. It was, you kept, you, you just, you didn't, you know, you'd sit in your little spot and you didn't say too much, you know, unless the screws were away. Yeah, when I was when I was in Derek, I, like, one of the things that, when I first got there, one of the things that... Um, one of the kids said to me, and I, and I know the way he said it to me, it was like he, he said, look, mate, there's some really bad things that happen here. And that was the thing that none of the kids back at Mount Druitt when I, on the outside had ever told me about that, that, that the bad things that were happening. And what the bad things were, there was a lot of sexual abuse uh, going on in them um, homes, and in particular of a night time. They, they, were, they were dormitory setups and you could see everyone. It was like all it was is sort of like there were beds back to back in rows and, and everyone could see everyone. And, you know, when I, and the first night there, I, you know, I seen um, officers coming, uh, getting kids out of the beds. And 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 and, and what was happening is, other night times there's two officers watching over these kids, but you'd see these, you know, what I led to believe, and maybe it was different, um, officers coming in all night, they were coming in through the, the entrance and I'd sit there and then they'd grab a, grab a kid, take him into the uh, uh, toilet block and, and they were like, a lot of kids were being sexually assaulted there. Um, it didn't take long, uh, and that eventually did happen to me. Um, um, and uh, and it left it did it left some pretty bad scars on me after. I, I don't think for a long time I wasn't ever the same kid after it. And you know, because the thing is, you know, you grow up with this belief that um, if someone ever tried that on me, I'll kill them and everything like. I, I, like I can tell you through experience, I was one of those people that said that sort of stuff and that. And um, it doesn't pan out that way, you know. You're just a young kid that's been overpowered um, and, and, and by someone in a position of authority and doing some horrible things to you. And um, it was a, it was a crazy place that that Derek because it was sort of it was like a free for all for it was just a pedophile. It was a dead set pedophile's paradise, you know, what they were doing to kids and and um, and there was just no accountability. There was one guy now who's up on charges himself and a lot of kids just said, it's no use telling him he was the boss of the place and there was no one, because it'll just get worse for you. And, you know, and that was the case. You know, I did I did try to say something to him and it just got worse to the point where I ran away. I ran away from Derek and, um, you know, Derek, you could run from South Windsor to Leperidge Park in, what, 25, 35 minutes and, um, and that's what I did one day. And by the time I got home, Derek, the boy, the people from Derek were already there um, and they said, oh, you know, they were really, really nice. My mum said, oh, they're really nice people. They seem really nice. And and they said, if you hand yourself in, um, they, you're not going to get charged by the police. So, you know, I didn't want to break my parents' heart. And, you know, my dad, I, I know what, what it was affecting my family. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to really affect them and, and burden them with my problems. I'd already, I'd already thought I'd hurt them enough. So, um, so I went back out to Derek and it just, and that just amplified the abuse, sort of amplified there. I don't. I end up doing. I end up doing nearly the whole six months out there and getting released. But I, you know, I, I got out of there a really broken kid. You know, with the benefit of hindsight. So, uh, with the benefit of hindsight now, you know, I, I can really, I can look back and see how broken I was. I, I could really see that change in who I was. You know, but at the time, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see any change at all. I didn't even notice it because what I was suffering from was a really bad dose of trauma. Mm. And during that time, like, did you talk to anyone about it? Oh, uh, look, uh, it was sort of it was one of those things back then. It was, it was an un, uh, an unspoken thing. Everyone knew it had happened. Everyone, like I, you know, I, I, all these kids, every kid knew what had happened to each other. But it was one of those things. It was like a pretty sick thing. It was like because what happens? What a perpetrator will do to you? Leave you with a, a whole heap of um, leave you a whole heap of shame. And that shame sort of thing is something that you don't really want to talk about. And it's it's not like we're going to sit around and talk about what had happened and how we're feeling about it. Like we just didn't want to talk about it. We just desensitized and in our heads pretended it didn't actually happen to us, you know. And 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 that and that was the case for a long time, you know. You know, one thing Derek was though. Derek was a college, you know. 
I always found those, the kids from near the city were really advanced as far as crime goes. They were the kids that were stealing Porsches before anyone. They were really, you know, particularly kids from Redfern, Newtown, Erskineville, and those sort of areas were really good car drivers. They could really, they were really top of the top of the chain sort of car drivers. And so what I did, what I learned out of Derek is I learned how to steal, one, I learned how to steal Porsches. I'd break into sports stores and I learned how, all these, so it was sort of like a, the college of knowledge as, as, as it were. And um, so I, I, I sort of came out of there and, 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 and I had no intentions of, of getting a job and going straight. I wanted, I wanted that sort of, I wanted that action. I wanted, I wanted to sort of, you know, steal a Porsche and break into sports stores and get in these chases and everything like that. And that's what I did. You know, I came out of there as well as I was like a badly desensitized kid because of the abuse. I came out of there really seeking a, a thrill in my life, you know, and uh, that was always going to, I was, that, that was always going to escalate and keep escalating and escalating and, uh, and, and you know, and that's what it did. So I came out, it wasn't long after I started stealing Porsches and it was, it was you know, you'd come back into Mount Druid. The main street of the, uh, uh, Mount Druid is a place called Luxford Road and it goes right through Mount Druid. And you turn up in there and you, if you're in a nice sort of 911 turbocharger or 930 twin turbocharged Porsche, you just know they're not going to be able to catch you in that. So you... You know, and, and it felt good. It felt like, fuck, it was like I was sticking my finger up at them and saying, you got no hope here. I'll fucking, you know, I'll take you on. And they'd come down. And it was a really funny place, Mount Druid, because um, people would cheer you on. People, they'd come out of their houses and they'd be doing, yeah, good on you, mate. Fucking give it to them. And you'd be in a chase with the coppers behind you and people are going out waving for you, you know what I mean, and cheering. It was like fucking you're great racing a car at Bathurst, you know, and... Um, yeah, and I'd be doing sports stores and, and stuff like that, and, you know. And it was that there was that thing when you do a sports store, you get the clothes that are too big for you, and you know some family's got a, a brother or a son or something like that in jail. So you go and drop off a bag of clothes that you're not going to do anything with, and say, "Oh, this is for him when he gets out." It's, there was like a camaraderie in that area for that sort of for the people who were locked up or or doing it tough, you know, or you know, or you go or you go over to someone's house and they've got a, a furniture or something like that. So you go and break in a go and do a break and enter and deliver a whole heap of furniture. And that's what we come with. We it was sort of like that Robin Hood sort of mentality back then. And, you know, and I like that. I, and, you know, and it's something that's with me today still and always will be is that having a generous heart, you know, and um, and always looking out for the underdog and, and, and looking out for and, and, and try to look after the battlers, you know. Yeah, there's something special about that place, man. There's something special. And and we've all got it. Like Mount Druitt, Campbelltown, fucking Maroubra, Redfern, all of those battlers areas, There's I've always... I've always enjoyed that part of the, you know, that community where people will look out for each other. I've always really, and I've really relished that, you know. I'd, yeah, it's good. And do you want to talk about going into an adult prison and then yeah. drug addiction? And sure. Yeah. Well, I was about 16, turning 17, and um, I remember I, I, I just got pinched for something when I was at Cobbin, Cobbin Boys' home here at Warrington, and, um, and, and my mate had just, my mate had not long, one of the boys I'd been in Derek with had not long got out, and um, and he rang me and, and he said, "Oh, mate, where?" And he rang me and I said, "Well, I'm going, I've got caught tomorrow and I'm a chance of getting out." And then, um, so um, so he turned up in a stolen car as I was getting out, and we jumped in a stolen car from out front of Cobham there, and and then we just went on this uh, like a spree. We stole one car and we made our way all the way over to Whale Beach. And Whale Beach is like an affluent area of Sydney. It's on the northern, northern, north, northern peninsula, and the beaches, the northern beaches there. And, and I always, it was sort of one of those areas. I always used to go over to North Shore, and that's where I used to steal cars from and do breaking enters and all that sort of stuff. It was sort of my, I don't know. I sort of justified myself, like I was saying. Well, I'm not because I, I, I wasn't a big fan of stealing from from the local area. I just didn't want to, you know, stuff over the local people, and and I always had that in me. And um, so I went over there, and, and then. Um, up on Whale Beach Road, we've seen this uh, a gunmetal grey 930 twin turbo Porsche. And that's, as a kid, that's the one you want. That's the trophy. That's the gold trophy in 1982. And you're not going to get caught in one of them things. Them things are like an F111 uh, plane, uh, fighter jet. Anyway, um, so I've got one of them. Uh, you know, what you're learning, that you can steal one of them in 60 seconds. You can have one of them started in 60 seconds. And um, so I started that and off we went. And uh, But what had happened is we, we'd, um, someone that's, Spotted the the coppers knew we were on that peninsula because of one of the cars we'd been in the chase earlier. They, they got away and knew we were up in that area. So when you come out of Whale Beach, 
there's one road out of there, and it's called Baron Joey Road. And when we got down to Newport, they, they tried pushing a cop car in front, in front of us, and we got around that. And anyway, we're, we're on this road. It's called French's Forest Road, and we're going up there, and and it's normally a really dark road. And um, man, it was all of a sudden it was really, really light, you know. And I flicked open the sunroof as we, because we're in a we're in a chase. Flicked open the sunroof, and there's a police helicopter. It was one of the first times they ever used police helicopters in a police chase. And I just went far out, you know, and um, and we just were hitting, I don't know, maybe 220 kilometres an hour, 240 kilometres an hour on that road, and we just weren't getting away from them. We got over over to Cremorne, and then um, we went down a dead end or jumped into Sydney Harbour and tried swimming away, and we got caught by the, the, the water police. Anyway, I went before Bajura Children's Court, and um, a judge... Uh, sentenced as he stipulated, he sentenced to 12 months in prison and he stipulated to be served in an adult prison. And um, and I just I just thought it was one of those things that they were trying to trying to scare us and that sort of thing. And I didn't really think it was going to happen. And, and, you know, the lawyer that we had was dead set hopeless and he, he just said, no, nah, you'll be right, we'll appeal this and it shouldn't, you know, and I'll let all the authorities know this shouldn't be happening to you. Still didn't think it was happening. We drove out Anzac Parade in a bull wagon. I, I still didn't think we are going there until we got to Long Bay Prison Central in 1984, it was, it was called the Central Industrial Prison at Long Bay. It was one of the most uh, heavy-duty prisons in Australia at the time, and they had um, they had one wing section of the Central Industrial Prison that was like a protection wing. And what had happened? It had all like uh, like pedophiles, corrupt cops, corrupt screws, um, and just and and police informers and uh, crown witnesses, and that's they had them in that one because. They, they couldn't be anywhere else. And um, and they and because of our rage, I was saying, well, you're too young to be out in the mainstream. And they said, we're going to put you in here for your own protection. And, uh, and you know, what I know now, that was the worst place that they could have ever put us. And that first night, they put um, my cell, my, my co-accused, he went into one cell with, uh, so he went in there with another two blokes and I went in with two blokes. And, and you know, and, you know, I later found out the two blokes that, um, I went in a cell with that night were convicted pedophiles. And, um, you know, I was a young 16 year old kid. I would have been about 40. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was underdeveloped kid for my age at the time. And I would have been about 40, 44 kilos at best. Um, um, you know, I wasn't like in a, and anyway, long story short, there, I got sexually abused there that night. Um, and so did my co accused. And anyway, when we, when we, went into the wing the next day and when we're in the wing the next day there was a heap of boys there from the boys homes but they were, they were there they were a bit different than us they'd been there for multiple escapes none of the boys homes could could keep them or anything like that so we weren't there under the same criteria as they were we were just there as a deterrent type sentencing and um look there was a lot of bad things that happened in there and and, and one bloke in particular i got first got introduced to heroin there and i was by a, a bloke who was a negrophiliac a negrophiliac a person who had sex with dead bodies and he gave me um, heroin for the first time, was sort of to get me to shut my mouth. And um, you know, it was really sad, man. It was it was a really sad thing. And I reckon I I reckon I I contracted hep- hepatitis C from that that incident too, because the syringe I had it in was fucking it had a it had a piece of thong as a plunger and a nail as uh, as a nail as a plunger. And a, it was just it was disgusting. And um, so yeah, and I think I, anyway, I had that, and that really numbed me. And, and you know, and all these these people tell you where you, at the time there was like, um, you know, Cabramatta had a heroin epidemic going on there, and I said you can go on there, and I, I just learned everything about the 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 using and getting of heroin, and um, you know, I got out of, I ended up getting transferred back to the boys' home, which was Mount Penang at the time, and it was called it was called a Section ninety four A. And I got back there and I was sort of t- treated like um, a bit of royalty there. You know, this is the kid who came back from jail and all the kids wanted to know about jail and everything. Like, no, I'm not going to tell them what really goes on, you know. You know, being a kid full of ego and that sort of thing, you sort of, you know, you colour it in a little bit as, as, as I did back then. And then um, eventually I got released from uh, Mount Penang um, with a taste of the heroin, you know. And, um, you know, one of the first things I did when I got out is went up to Cabramatta and got on. And um, and then that led to a you know a pretty serious heroin habit and you know once again you know by this stage my father had just passed away from emphysema and uh, my mum was really struggling with the passing of his death so you know um, passing of him and um, so you know it was just a really tough time and it was really tough so I was dealing with my father's death the the abuse I had a shitload of trauma going on and I was a kid that I didn't know how to compartmentalise. I didn't know what to do with this trauma. I didn't even know I had it. All I knew that, you know, I was trying to block something out that I didn't, you know, all I know is I had this 
this deep, dark thing that was coming from in me all the time and all I wanted to do it. And if I had a shot, I didn't feel it. So I was always avoiding this horror, this horrible feeling that was there. And, you know, and what I know what that all is now is it's shame and, and um, you know, and um, so so what I was constantly doing was blocking that out and um, but my offending escalated. I, um, you know, and then I, and then I you know, I, by the time I was 18, um, I, myself and my co-accused, the bloke I met at Darryl Boys Home who I'd got in the Porsche chase with, we got charged with breaking into, it was called Grace Brothers at the time, I think it's called Myers or David Jones now, at Macquarie Centre and we got sent, this time we got sent to a, uh, a prison as adults and we went to the mainstream side of prison at, at uh, Long Bay, uh, the old MRC and things were different. It was none of these sexual predators getting around and it was really, really frowned upon blokes that were like that. So yeah, and that's where that all started. And how long did the drug addiction go for? Oh, it went for a long time. I, um, you know, I, I could fast. I, there's a bit of a story that goes with it. I, I think, you know, I, I used from the age of, say, 16 until I was 30. Oh, not until I was 30. When I, when I was 22, I, what happened was I eventually, I, I, I'd done about two and a half years on that adult sentence and I got out and I started robbing banks and then... Um, and that just fuck, mate. When you get that sort of money, got that sort of money, access to to to, to that sort of money, uh, uh, your, your drug addiction uh, really escalates. And I, you know, at one stage, I was using fifteen hundred dollars a day, which is you know around about at that stage. Although it was five grand, about five grams of heroin a day. And but what happened to me was, I fast forward, I ended up in jail in Darwin. And, um, you know, I had, there was just nothing. There was no, it's not like, there was just no access to it and that sort of thing. And I, and I was getting, I was in a really bad spot. Like I, I, when I was in jail and down, these screws up there, them rednecks up there, man, one thing they do like to do, and they like to fight, they like to bash you and they like to let you know that they're the boss of you. And um, in the end there, it was all this sort of stuff started coming to me and I thought, fuck, you know, I started taking ownership and I said, I'm allowing these people to be able to do this sort of shit, like bash me and do all this horrible shit to me from my actions, if I, you know, if I fucking, you know, if I give up the fucking drugs, there's a fair chance I'm not going to be in this position. So, yeah, I I, I got out of jail. At, uh, I went to jail at that stage. I went from, I was by that stage, I was about 21 years old. I got out when I was 30 and I was fucking eight or nine years clean, you know. Um, yeah. But there's that big story in between that. The big story in between that was like, you know, in, um, I, uh, I got out when I got out, I got out from Goulburn after doing that two, about two and a half years, and um, I, I look there was a big part of me that wanted to go straight and everything like that. But I, um, you know, I was working for my brother as a, a trades assistant, apprentice electrician, but I was still going out on weekends and and, and using and, um, and and but that weekend would go from the weekend to Monday, and then it'd go from weekend Monday Tuesday, and next minute just went full on. And that's when I started, like, you know, I um, started robbing banks. I robbed my first bank on my own, basically. We've, look, I had a bloke as a driver, but I went in on my own first. With, and I just had a shit a knife about that. I went to Salvo's and got this knife for about three bucks. And it was, a, it was like a, a machete and I rocked into this bank. It was the uh, Commonwealth Bank at Gordon. And um, and I think I never got much. I got like 17000 on my own. And, and when you when you got someone in, in, with you, you got to sort of go halves with him. So I went halves with him. I went a lot. And then uh, when you're using heroin, and that doesn't go long. And, you know, I always like nice things. I like nice cars. I like nice clothes, jewellery and that sort of thing. So it didn't last long. I robbed that one, on a, I think it was on a, on a Monday, and I robbed another one on a Friday. But this time it was a lot different. It was like I had a shotgun. I had two co-accused, and um, that was the um, Commonwealth Bank at Lane Cove, and that had a front and back ex- entrance. So no, that's from Robin Banks. That's ideal, you know. So you come in through the back door. Um, cop shop was about two hundred meters down the road. We parked the car in the driveway, put a club lock on it, let, let the tires down so they couldn't get get to us, and then just ran up and hit it. And we got we done a lot better that time. And then um, then I robbed another one. And, and you know, by this time I've got a, I've got a nice unit. I've got my own unit full of furniture. I've got a, you know brand new car. Um, you know, brand new motorbike. I'm thinking I'm living large. I'm still using copious amounts of heroin. Um, I'd met a girl who was a school teacher. And, you know, I, I sort of had this thing in my head that I had my shit together because I had all this material thing, but I was just so, so twisted, you know. I was in so much pain. I was in so much pain. And, um, and you know, 
it's, it's taken a long time to even admit that, that at that time I was in so much pain and like, you know, because it's all that bravado shit. No, I'm right, I'm sweet. I'm, and um, and I was in so much pain. I was such a confused kid with, the you know, being able to look back on it. Um, you know, and then um, I got pinched. Uh, I got pinched one day. I got pinched, the cop was turned up and uh, pinched us for these uh, banks and ended up going to Parramatta. And anyway... I always I had this other a little charger at the front at, at Campsy Court and um, Campsy Court was a court where they used to pull up in the in the in the truck and unload you on the street and walk you over into the police station or the, or the cells at the court and I always knew that we could get away from there and um, so got really fit in jail and trained for for about four or five months and, and just running five k's and doing sprints and four hundred meter sprints and. Carrying blokes on my back and doing this, and I had this old SAS soldier bloke just giving us, and like we we trusted him enough to tell him what tell him what we we're going to be doing, and then um, so what I did, I subpoenaed a couple of my mates to court as witnesses for me, and I was going to just a, a, a car stealing charge or something like that. So we turned up to court, and, um, we took these packets of salt because the SAS bloke told us they said, look, what you do is surprise someone, get a handful of salt in front of their eyes, and see what they do. What they do, when you find, people don't know, they could think it could be bleach powder or whatever, they, they, they cover up because they feel that stinging. They don't know it's salt. And then um, um, so what happened, we, we, we jumped off through the salt, uh, through the best right hand of my life and knocked this copper out, clean out, cold, got out, ran away and uh, got in a car and then um, went back and actually robbed the bank that I was on remand for, the National Australia Bank of Taramone. It was a Vietnamese security guard and he was... Um, Man, I just I sort of felt sorry for him because he had a gun. I took his gun off him, and then um, but it was around that was around about the fifteenth of uh, December, and it wasn't ten days off Christmas or something like that. And on the way out, I don't know why I did it, and my mate was howling on me. I said, "I give him his gun back," and I said, "Yeah, Merry Christmas, mate," because he because when I first turned up, he said, "I'm going to lose my job and all that." And I said, "Yeah, don't worry about that," and um, give him his gun back, and I said, "Merry Christmas," and and it was you know, and I apologised, man. I hope you don't you lose your job, and I took off and ran away anyway. Long story short, I ended up getting pinched for robbing a bank up in Darwin. Now, that Darwin, man, I'll tell you, man, back in 1990, man, that was red, redneck city, man. Like, oh, I just couldn't believe it, what it was. We met a girl in a club who worked in a – who was a bank teller and she knew all about what goes on and, and really – but she didn't sort of – it came out later. She made all these admissions that weren't true about herself, that what she – what her part of it was. And I'd never, never really understood that because, you know, I was never going to – say that that happened or my cow accused was never going to say, I just don't understand why she made that she said that she drove the car when she didn't. What happened is I was at Darwin Airport and I watched my cow accused jumping on a plane. We're going to fly back to Sydney and do some work in Sydney. When I say work, rob some more banks. And I watched him get walk off the plane and I knew who the two blokes who were walking him off the plane, obviously the detectives. And I, so anyway, I, I went out in the car park, I jumped in the car, I followed him back to the police station. I was hoping he'd jump out and have a go, but he just didn't. And anyway, so I drove off, I drove about 400 k's out of Darwin to a place called Mataranka, jumped on a bus there, going to Alice Springs, and um, I was just fucking, oh, I had no luggage on me, and I knew the bloke, the bus driver was on on the bus, and he must, they must have been, I just got, I was a bit sus on him anyway. Overnight, we stopped at a place called Pine Creek, and I bought an Akubra hat, and it had the the corks and that on, and I bought a fucking I Love Australia t-shirt, and a pair of fucking buy hiking boots with the bus driver socks, so I was doing my best to look like a fucking, you know, a backpacker. And I was really trying to smother that up. Anyway, in the morning, you know, I talked to this, this girl was sitting next to me and I told her, I said, well, when you get to Alice Springs, I said, I'll check, you know, motel and everything and, and live it up for a bit. Any moment, when we got to there, we got to Alice Springs and went to jump off the bus and all these blokes just jumped all over me. And then I put on my best sweet, Swedish accent. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they're looking at they're looking at each other, and I'm looking at this girl, and she's looking at me, going, "What the fuck?" And I'm saying, "Helga, Helga, call the embassy! I'm being attacked!" And they're looking at her, looking at me, looking at me, and then and they're just thinking, "Fuck, maybe we got the wrong bloke here." And then this old cop, I remember him. He, he walked up, and he he's got a roll in his hand, and he goes, "Mate, or okay, Ian's from Sweden." He said, like in his best Aussie accent, he said, "You haven't got a tattoo on your right shoulder blade." He said, "Mate," he said, "I'm letting you go," and he lifted my shirt up. He said, okay, Russell, the joke's over, and I knew I was fucked. So, um, and then and he took the piss out of me. He said, you blokes were going to let him go. And um, anyway, long story short, I went back up to Darwin. I got sentenced to uh, nine years of non-parole or five years, which was like one of the biggest sentences ever handed out in Darwin at the time. 
because they never really had many bank robberies and that up there. So, um, but my time in Darwin was pretty brutal. I'll tell you, I was in like in a, a Segro block and they used to have like a squad, uh, like a riot squad type squad down there. And they used to come down and they, they used to, I used to punch on with them about five days a week. And, used to, and one of them said, we'll give you the weekends off so you can recover, you know. And, and the funny thing about all that is the nurses and the whole nursing staff and that are on, they see you all busted up and they go, oh, mate, you have a mischief. And you just go, oh, yeah, I slipped over. You know, um, because that's just part and parcel of it, you know. And um, But that's when I sort of had a bit of an awakening, like, you know what I mean? Like I was a bloke that was in a whole heap of pain, suffering some serious trauma, getting traumatised on a daily basis. And... Um, and it really made me think of what I wanted in life, you know, and, um, you know, it made me think about a few choices and, you know, and I sort of made a bit of a choice then to sort of um, really consider knocking the drugs on the head because that kept on leaving me to, to, to jail. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, as much as I look back at that time, I, I, you know, as much as how tough it was and how, how bar, barbaric it was, I look back on that as sort of, man, that, that built something in me, that. It built a really special kind of resilience, which I still have today. And, um, you know, it just made me think about, I never want to be in a position where people can have this much power over me ever again, especially cowards like them guys, you know, and that's what they really were, turning up with a bunch of mates and, you know, and I don't know, and being in a position of power where they can abuse it. And like, But anyway, so I got, a long story short, I went to Alice Springs and that was like an eye opener. Like, you know, I met some beautiful, amazing, like, Beautiful. I met these people, like I was in jail there. And English is a second language to the Aboriginal people there, you know. They're just beautiful people. And, man, the white men can learn so much from them people. And um, and there's these people from, uh, they're Warpry people from a place called Yindamu. It's out in the Tanami Desert. And they sort of took me in as one of theirs, you know, because I an incident happened where a white bloke who was a rapist spilt water on one of the old fellas. And I just took care of it. I said, mate, if you don't apologise to him, man, I'm fucking, I'll, I'll give you what for. And I did. And then um, and he, they just was just so kind to me, man. They were just so kind, and I, you know, and I started learning a bit about their language and their culture and everything like that. And I was just really, really beautiful people. And um, and I left there, like you know, I just left there a little more. By that by that stage, my time in Alice Springs, I was nearly about three years. I'd been away from New South Wales, and I got extradited back to New South Wales more interstate transfer to front these other charges. And um, you know, I, I, I think it was about nearly nearly three, two and a half, three years clean. And, you know, I got back to New South Wales, the opportunity to use drugs presented itself. I said, no, just, I just, I was in autopilot. I just went, no, that ain't for me no more. I want different. And then, um, you know, I, I eventually went before court. I got sentenced to, I think it was, I got 15, about 15 years on the top and, and eight years on the bottom, which well, I would have ended up doing close to nine years by the time I got out. I, I came in when I was about 21, 22 and got out when I was 30. Um, my girl, who was a school teacher, had stayed with me the whole way, and um, and I, you know, I just got out to a different world. And I, you know, I, um, I just with every determination, like I was, I wanted to keep, I wanted to stay clean. I just wanted to get a job. I got a job doing scaffolding um, in the city um, with um, my mate, and, um, and that was really, really hard work. But it just gave me a good work ethic. It gave me a great work ethic, and then. Um, and then I eventually, um, I then eventually go, went up to the Northern Rivers to a place called Cabarita Beach, and I was a, I was a fitness instructor at a Japanese jockey school. Fitness and health and fitness has always been something I've been passionate about. I was always a really decent trainer in prison, and and um, even before I went to Derrick, I was one of those kids that always went on runs and kept fit and that sort of thing. So uh, I was a fitness instructor. And, you know, I broke up with that girl, and I, I met another girl. I ended up having a couple of kids, and we started a, a marketing and advertising business. So I started kicking some really good goals. I bought a house at Karumba. And, um, but I always had this underlying issue and that was the abuse itself I'd never dealt with. I'd never dealt with it. You know, what I know now, that was always going to raise its head until it got dealt with. And um, long story short, I was by this stage, I was 12 years clean and sober and um, I started drinking, you know, and I'll tell you something now, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you, with me, I, I can't have one row of chocolate. I heat a whole block. I can't have one Tim Tam. I smash the pack. I'll never do anything in ones. I'm an all or nothing type of guy. And um, and I had one beer and then I drank a cart and then you know, and then I had one line of coke and then I'd do a couple of bags and then a couple of Beckys and then I'd be feeling dog shit the next day and I'd go and have a shot of heroin, you know, and that's what it led to. And long story short, it wasn't long before I was back in jail for doing just shitty robberies, you know, the ones that I'm embarrassed about, like on fucking chemist and post office and stuff like that. 
And I really struggled for about 10 years after that from 2004 to 2014. It was funny, it was that, that 10 year period, I really struggled to get clean again. I struggled I, with all the determination in the world and all the willpower and all that. I couldn't sort of get my, what changed for me was I was on a plane going to Perth, I'm being, I was up to no good. And I was reading a book called Sleepers and uh, Sleepers is about a, 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 it was a movie with Kevin Bacon and it. it was about um, a, a bunch of kids that were abused in an orphanage and they get out and square up on the abusers and that sort of stuff. I'm reading this book and this guy I read over and said, man, that's a great book. He said, you know, and I, and I don't know, I just blurted it out and I said, you know, it's a story of my life, you know. And then he told me about the Royal Commission in the Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse and he said, mate, that's coming up and you'll get an opportunity to tell your story there and you might be able to get some, you know, some really good support from it. And, um, and I, he, he, look, he planted a seed in my head and it didn't really come to fruition right there and then. But long, what happened was I was, I was back in, uh, I got back to Sydney and I went on it. I went and started robbing banks again. And there's, mate, it was like the party was over, but I kept on turning up and it was like there was nothing in them. And the Suncorp make ways you could still get five, maybe 10 grand out of them if you're lucky. And I robbed one in Haymarket, robbed one over in North Sydney. And then um, you know, I had a bit of drama in Sydney, like getting chased out of one. So I, then I got pinched for robbing one up in um, Coolangatta on the Gold Coast and um, sitting that up in jail. and. Man, I was just so badly beaten. I was so badly beaten, and I, you know, and, one, one, and literally, I got, back, I got pinched. I got when I came out of the bank, I had about four or five super citizens jump all over me, and fucking oh, mate, just give it to me. And one of them saying to me, "I just saved your life," and I was fucking thinking, "Can you stop punching me in the head?" And, you know, and but um, I went out to the jail with every intentions and knocking myself, and um, you know, and, and you have a plan. When you're going to do that sort of thing, you think this is what you're going to, whether you're going to do a note or whatever, you know, write the note so your family get a little bit of peace out of it. And, and um, you know, I was going to use the coaxial cable from the TV. And so when I got to my cell that night, there was no coaxial key, cable. It had been cut down. Someone had been using it for something else. And couldn't do, you know, couldn't do anything with it. And I just had a restless night. And anyway, I woke up in the morning, some bloke coming off me a shot. And I did, I hated this bloke. I'd hated him for ages. And I said, mate, no matter how bad I was traveling, I could never take anything off you. Then I went out to the unit and there was a young bloke that was got all his books out studying and he said, um, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm studying psychology. He said, you give me some device. Years ago, I took it and this is where it's led to me. And I was fucking going, fuck, I'm wearing And then he looked at me, he looked me up and down and he said, maybe you should take a bit of your own advice. And then um, I had a mate of mine who was a lawyer up in Brisbane, you know, and I, I thought, you know, I'm going to get about 10 years for this. And, um, and he came and visited me that day and he said, mate, I'll get you about three or four years. He said, oh, I'll make sure you get looked after. And so by the, the course of that day, and I'll come back from a legal visit and I looked in the education and I said, you know, what do you got? And I said, you can do tertiary prep, which is like HSC, crash course. I left school at 14 and he said, no, he said, we can put you through that. And I said, what do you like to do? And I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind studying law. And then, um, so it was, it was just really funny 24 hours that I went from wanting to kill myself to having a bit of hope because I felt... You know, I had a bit of integrity and morals. I wouldn't take something off someone I didn't like. You know, I'd planted a seed in a kid that had changed his life. Most probably weren't going to get the 10 years I was expecting. You know, and I had, I thought, I've got one more. I'm going to have one, I've got one more shot at it. I'll either do this full on or not. And then um, I kept on seeing this thing on the TV on the 7.30 report about the Royal Commission on Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. And um, so I thought, fuck, you know, I'm going to write to him. I wrote to him. I wrote a bit about my story and I couldn't believe it. Two weeks later, I get called for a legal visit and here's these people in front of me wanting to know everything. And they, they said, first, we want you to know we believe you. We've got enough evidence that did happen to you and many other kids like you. So um, I told them my story and um, and they just, bang, put me straight in touch with a trauma. I had a trauma counsellor contacted me once a week initially for about a year and then once a week for a fortnight. And I, But I, I remained doing that counselling for up to four years. I went to court, got a really good result. Um, um, and it's, it's done my finished tertiary prep when I was in jail. I put, it was funny, it was just a really, really good way. I recommend it to anyone that's in, in prison now. I was like, I put the TV away, I put it under the bed, and I just got the study books out and I just studied, you know. I set up a, I set up a, a, a mat on the floor, so every about every 45 minutes, so, so I wasn't sitting at the thing, I'd jump and do 100 sit ups and then. And I, I just got this really amazing routine that gave me this really clear vision of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. And um, yeah, and, I, and the Royal Commission progressed on. And I, you know, I was in jail. In jail, when you're in jail, anyone that knows jail is, especially them like Queensland jails, they've got two phones on a wall and, and there's like 50 men in the yard 
and, and everyone knows what your conversation is on that phone, you know, and I'm talking to Royal Commission and I just sensed something was going on. A few, like a, particularly young kids that ain't too well educated were a bit sus and I sent them whisper and everything. So called everyone out in the yard and I said, listen, I just want to make it really loud and clear. I ain't talking to, the only people I'm talking about is the Royal Commission about what happened when I was a kid. And, and um, I said, this ain't about talking to authorities or anything like this. This is about changing my life, you know, and I don't give a fuck. If anyone's got a problem, let's just sort it out. And long story short, this is where the, the, my organisation was sort of really formed because I had so many people come and tell me about the abuse they stuff and I put them in contact with the right people and I showed them how to write out their, what happened to them and, 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 and you know, and, and, and sort of created like a support group for each other within prison. And um, But um, I ended up getting uh, interstate transfer because my family's from New South Wales and I got in contact, a lady contacted me when I was in prison about being involved in this justice project, the lady was, um, she, at the time, she was a barrister um, with Aboriginal Legal Aid and she, what the people that had helped in jail uh, had told all about me. And so um, she contacted me and asked me to be involved in this justice project where, you know, survivors get to tell their stories. And instead of going before the courts and getting punished and constantly punished about what had happened to them, um, that, woman now is my partner she's a she's a she's a bar she's um she does criminal law and and does a bit of the abuse work herself um but what had happened i i i, I was in jail and i had like two weeks to go and the cop was turned up and charged me with six old robberies and um and i just thought fuck i was never gonna end i was i was doing the right thing because i was going to a i was nearly four years clean and i was getting paroled to a rehab i was going to get paroled to glebe house and and then I just thought, fuck this. But anyway, my compensation claim came through, so I got a little bit of money and I could afford. Things change for you when you can afford decent lawyers, you know, and that's what happened in that case. And I could afford a decent lawyer and I got a bloke called Peter O'Brien who I thoroughly recommend. Um, so Peter O'Brien, I've got him on board and um, he said, first thing we'll do is get your bail. And I said, oh, I don't get fucking bail, especially on robberies. He said, no, nah, we'll get your bail because it's a thing... Um, uh, it's called delay and they're not, they, they can do it, but they're not allowed to do it. And it's really frowned upon. So he took me before central local court and, um, mate, the, the judge was fucking really filthy on the prosecutor. He said, you've had four years to charge this bloke and, you know, you're doing it now and, and you'll agree it's delayed. The prosecutor agreed to delay. And he said, okay, you agree it's delay. I agree it's delay. He said, I'm going to tell you something now. I'm going to give this bloke bail. And then my bloke said, well, we've got a rehab for him to go to and, um, and, um, and we can put up surety. So, Long story short, ended up getting out on bail, um, getting paroled and getting out on bail and then uh, went to a rehab up the uh, Coffs Harbour called Adele House and I completed that program and then I stayed in the community and done outreach from there, got myself a little unit and I set up the voice of a survivor and I started on my own. And One thing jail is horrible with is jail, and I don't know if it's purposely or not, but they starve you of technology and it's one of the hardest things to adapt to when you get out these days, you know, you fucking go and buy an Opal card, like how, where do you buy one of them? How do you use it or whatever? And my case, in my case, it was just just learning how to use a basic a basic Apple Mac computer and I just had no idea how to do it. I'd um, been accepted to study law at the University of Southern Cross um, and that was gonna cause me some troubles because of my lack of technology. Um, and I started off the voice of a survivor on my own. I had a couple of people come and go and. Uh, and people see my business idea and they all want, they, they just think, oh, there's a big money maker thing on this and they're going to, and I had a couple of people steal my idea and go out on their own and and their money orientated. I was never going to be solely money. I, look, I've got to make an earn out of it. I've got to make an earn out of it and I could make five times the amount of money I do, but I choose not to. What I, The purpose of my, my organisation is making sure survivors get treated in dignity and respect. And we're always at war, like, you know, war. So what the process of what we do is we, so a client comes to us, we put them in contact with a lawyer. The lawyer does a qualification, then we interview them, and then they tell their story to us, and then we pass that on to the lawyer, and then we support them throughout the whole process to the point mediation's where it settles at court. And um, and but we make sure the lawyers aren't robbing them at the end. We you know if the lawyer gives them an invoice they don't like, we we will challenge it for them. And you know at this point in time, you know I've got like thirteen and a half thousand clients, and that's it's, man, it's such a rewarding thing to do. And I I live by. The saying, my, my favourite saying is, you know, I try to give more than I take. And um, you know what? And since I've lived like that, I've never went hungry. I've never had to sleep out in the street. You know, I've always had clothes on my back. And I've, I've got a pretty good life because of it. I've got a beautiful partner. 
you know, I've got my kids in my life who sort of respect me. Oh, and I went back to court for them robberies and it was the, that, that uh, uh, I fronted a judge down at, Mount, at um, uh, the Downing Centre and it was just amazing. I, I should like, uh, the, my barrister at the time was a bloke called Richard Pontello and he said after, he goes, I've been practising law for 30 years. He said, them judges' comments, he said, you want to frame them? He said, they're the best ones I've ever heard in my life. And the judge said, he said, you were once a minister to society. He said, now you're a dead set asset to community and it's a society and a community. He said, if I was to send you back to jail today, he said, I'd be putting the community at a big disservice. He said, the work that you do, he said, cannot be replaced by anyone else but you. He said, your, he said, your story will change the lives of many and help a lot of people heal. And, man, I had my kids in my court and, you know, I got a bit emotional and I just felt so proud. Um, my partner was there and I've got a mate of mine he's, um, who I do a lot of work with. His name's Professor Ian Coyle, who's been a real big support of mine. He's a, he's a trauma, like he writes a lot of trauma reports. And um, I just had, you know, and it just made me realise like just what I've created since I've been out. Like now I've been out of prison for four and a half years and, you know, I'm starting to get, man, these corrective services are calling me in as an expert now to sort of fucking, you know, because they, they, you know, they, they're calling me in because they want ideas of how to make change. And, and if I can, and, you know, I, I even had a meeting this morning. How you make change is change everything. You know, everything needs a massive overhaul over there. I'm passionate about rehabilitation. I'm passionate because I say, and I say, I said, I had a meeting with the commissioners of, you know, about a month ago, and I say there's, a, there's thousands of Russell Mansers in prison. And all you've got to do is provide them with the right support. You know, mine was my compensation claim. I didn't get my compensation claim. I don't think none of this happened. I wouldn't have been able to get, on, get out on bail. I wouldn't have been able to put myself in a rehab. I wouldn't have been able to establish my business. So that was one of the biggest changing things with myself. I invest, what I did with my compensation claim is I invested in myself. But, I, you know, I'm a real big believer. With the right support, like jails, jails are a place full of fucking heavy-duty traumatised people, really traumatised people, whether it's intergenerational, sexual, physical, mental, emotional sort of trauma, you know, and and this approach in the past with punishing them and trying to and try to teach them a lesson and all that sort of thing and re-traumatizing them even worse, like you know, uh, it's going to go nowhere and it's not going to create a safer community. And there's way better ways, you know. And my, I'm, I'm, you know, I really do my research. I want to be in the future. That's what my sole passion wants to be: is helping people get rehabilitated, helping people reintegrate, helping people just, you know. Um, not have to go for this. Like, you know, I know people that'll go to Centrelink and they'll say, I oh, just jump on that computer and download this. That's enough for them. They're out of there. They're up the cross. They go get on because they feel like I'm stupid, you know. And that, this, this thing about, um, you know, uh, like, you know, not, ha- letting, not letting them have uh, access to technology because you know it's going to stuff them. We've got to change. There's so much to be changed. And um, yeah. What do you reckon is the biggest lesson you've learned? Uh, you, you've done what over 20 years in prison? 23. 23, 23 yeah. What's the biggest life, life lesson from that? Um, it's, for me, it's like <clears throat> all those thoughts and feelings are thoughts and feelings. And if you, if you let them pass some time and don't act on them, you know, give yourself time, you know. I had a bunch of mates and they were doing really well for themselves. And they said, mate, we just want you, we'll pay you. We'll give you a grand a week to do nothing. We'll just pay you to be patient. You just, and, and you know, and it's things don't come overnight out here, but but um, but just be patient, you know. And, and and you know the funny thing is, you can fucking sit in lines in jail all day, but when you get out of here, you want everything in a hurry, and it doesn't happen that way. So I think you know, it's, I, I know it's e- it's not it's easy for me to say because I've got a, a place to live and and on all that. It's hard when you when you got out and you've got nothing to be, and then someone says, mate, just be patient. It's not that fucking easy, but put yourself in a position. And what does your kids mean to you? My kids mean to well, my kids, I've got i I've got a 21-year-old uh and a 19-year-old, and um man, you know, and 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 I've seen how my behaviour and my actions have affected them, and they've picked up my character traits. Now I'm trying to give them they were my old character traits. I'm trying to give them my new character traits, and that's really hard. My youngest one's just a good kid. He's he's um he's um he works doing drives backhoe and machineries and that. My oldest one, he's done boys' homes, and it was really heartbreaking to go and visit the boys' homes where I've done boys' homes and and visit him and and seeing him picking up that way of thinking. No, through my actions, like he knows, he knows I work hard. 
And he's always bouncing things off. He goes, Dad, I've got this idea. What do you think of that? You know, and I'm always trying to present him with opportunities to kick a goal. I've got him, you know, I've got him a whole heap of different jobs and that sort of thing through my people I know. <coughs> and, um, oh, yeah, I love him to death, you know, and I really, you know, I just want to see him do well and, you know, and it, get, it pleases me when, when I see him not making the choices I made <coughs> and choosing life, you know. Before I had children, I said, when I have kids, I want them to grow up at the beach. I want them to be able to go surfing and everything like that. That's one thing I achieved. When I, when I was out for the six years, I bought a house at Corumban Beach and my kids grew up doing nippers and going, not so much, they'd done nippers for a little bit. I don't think they really liked it. Growing up, going to the beach, surfing with their mates, and they got so you know, growing around the beach, and that's that healthy. Try to incorporate that healthy lifestyle, but it doesn't matter whether you grow up in Vaucluse, Mount Druitt, Campbelltown, or Glebe. You know, if you if you're affected by some sort of trauma, you just, it doesn't matter where you are. Like you know, because it can, that's, that's where it can lead. You can lead your dysfunctional behaviour. A perpetrator's greatest weapon is 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 the victims or, you know, in the case of called silent, uh, survivor silence and shame. And when we, when we be quiet, we're hanging on to their stuff, you know, all that silent, that shame and that you feel don't belong to you. When you start talking about it, pass it back to the perpetrator himself and say, hey, man, hang on to your shit, you know, because I carried, and I'll say this, uh, I carried this backpack, of, a whole heap of shit, rubbish, horrible things that didn't belong to me for a hell of a long time. When I started talking about what had happened to me and 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 that, I was handing it back to its rightful owner, its perpetrator themselves, you know. And you know, if you're man, I just I know, I know like what where, what my my trauma led me to some really serious drug addiction. Where man, like I, I used to use heroin, and people say you don't use it for its effect; you use it to fucking live on the edge of death, you know. And um, and and that sort of that 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 avoidance of avoiding, avoiding your feeling. Where, where, where you're gonna get strength from is actually tackling your, your, feel, your feelings. It's like going to, you know, if you, you're playing a game of rugby league and there's a, a big, tough front row running at you all the time, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna stop him by standing out on the wing. You're gonna stop him by trying to have a go at tackling it. And it's very similar to your trauma. You gotta, you know, it takes, man, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's about standing up and, and, and taste it and just going, all right, hit me. And not let it knock you over and then stand back up and let it knock you over and eventually, You'll hold, you'll hold it up, you know, and um, yeah, it's really important. It's really important, man. People heal, man. People heal by talking, you know. We, and you know, there was a really tough guy in prison years ago. A lot, a lot of people know him for the eighties and nineties. He was a big curry fella uh, called Tim Matthews. Just tough, man. Like, man, that bloke looked like one of those racehorses at the racetrack about to go out and do a fucking like when you know he was just a real physical sort of guy really good guy and you know and um and i watched him once and i watched him on he was on on, on a on one of the st- shows on message dick called nitv and he was so, sort of saying you know i don't all this time and he said and he said i used to think i was strong and i was tough and everything like he said but he said when i learned how to feel my emotions he said in a cry he said man he goes i realized there was so much power in tears you know and um you know, that really just, that stuck with me forever and a day after hearing him say that because he was one of these guys I just really looked up to. You know, he was one of, I'd done, I'd done, a, I'd done a, little, uh, a few stick-ups and that with Tim and I just really thought, you know, I thought the world of him. He was just a really tough guy but so knowledgeable and, um, but once again, I, 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 you know, I, I, you know, I can look back on it and I think he had his own version of his trauma, you know. See, with the work we do, I'm contacted by some of the most hectic people in the jail system and they say, Russell, you know, I trust you, mate. I trust you enough to tell my story to. And, and you know, and, and, and some of these people are uh, some of the most violent, you know, written off by society type people there is. And, and you know, and, I've, and, and there's been a fair few of them. I'm just watching the healing process. I'm watching on a daily basis. You hear this bloke. He's in the Golden Supermax. Now he's making his way down to the minimum security because it's changing his way of thinking about himself. When they change their way of thinking about themselves, their behaviour changes and their actions changes and then all of a sudden they're not violent and they're, they're understanding. And, man, I'll tell you something. I, I, I'll tell you what I'm involved in will be the most rewarding thing, like daylight second. Like, you know, watching the birth of my children is, is number one. But I'll tell you, like, wow, that's like watching people heal. Is amazing, man. It really is. It's amazing, and you know, 
and watching, you know, I, I, I've heard a couple of your, your, the, uh, the podcasts that you do, and 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 seeing some of these kids' journey, like people's journey, like I sit there and I go, wow, man, what a, what an amazing story, what inspiration when people can overcome that trauma and do well with themselves. That's amazing, and I, I just man, I, man, I, I'm never gonna be a hater. I'm always gonna fucking, I'm gonna be a fucking on the mate, clapping, cheering people. I love seeing people do well, you know. And that's the beauty about when you deal with this sort of stuff, because what happens a lot, a lot of these really serious traumatized people like to take the focus of themselves. It's like fucking, oh mate, and that, and it's a, it's avoidance. Whether it's drugs, uh, it's you know all these different sort. Whether it's drugs, gambling, sex, or whatever, it's all about taking the focus off yourself. And what it, when you deal with this is you can really go internally and go, fuck, you know what, and you compartmentalise and dissect and fucking thing. And you, at the end of the day, you realise, hang on, I'm not a bad person. I'm actually actually good. And these, these screws and the coppers and courts and everything that have, you know, told me that I'm a scumbag and I'm, I'm this and everything, I'm not really, I'm just a decent person. I had some bad things happen to me that led to this or led to that. You know, and I'm actually, and it's really good seeing people embrace themselves, you know, embrace themselves. It's just... Oh, I love it. I love it. I love seeing, you know, people come together and unite and, man, through this work, it's, it's just amazing what I get to see. And I, you know, I, um, you know, I recently I got asked to speak to all the new commissioners and all, all the stakeholders in Corrective Services in New South Wales. And that was amazing. It was amazing that I got invited, not only got invited, I got actually paid to do it. And, uh, you know, and, um, just that, and that's my that's my own personal growth. Because I'll tell you what, when I'm using drugs and involved in crime, man, then people don't want to know me. They're not interested in my opinion, you know. So my opinion now, um, I hopefully can help people understand, you know, because you know that my, uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Nettie Smith was a, uh, a gangster and, and he died recently, and all these people on uh, social media um, bagging him and everything like that. And I just I wrote this really nice piece about okay, well. There's a correlation. There's a, there was a, a home called Tamworth where kids were brutalised. Nettie Smith went there. Um, Ivan Malat went there. Some of the worst curio- uh, killers we've ever had in this country went through there. They were badly bashed, traumatised and everything like that. And when you do that to people, they don't go on and do really nice things and hand out flowers to people on the street. They normally go on and perpetrate what happened to them. They, they, they're badly desensitised. So... They think dealing with their problems is, you know, well, you know, I was always told if uh, if I do something wrong, punch someone in the head. If if someone wants something off me, they just punch me, you know, and and so on and so forth. And um, and it's about educating people. Like, okay, I like to. You see this post person who's an extremely bad page uh, person. I want to rewind the tapes a little bit. Let's go back to the beginning and find out what happened to make that. Because kids ain't born bad. There's a lot of things that happen along the way to make people bad. Like there's. I don't know. I don't. I've maybe maybe one person I've ever in my life that I thought you were born bad. There's this string that happens to be. I like to wind. I'm, I'm the person who likes to rewind. I want to understand why you are, not what you are. 